Hi everyone and welcome back to the George Collection. I'm Rachel with Right Side Blonde. Today I'm excited to bring to you the Charles Barkley cover from February and March of 1996. I absolutely love this article. It was an interview between John Kennedy and Charles Barkley and Charles Barkley makes a lot of sense. I love the play on words from this issue too. It says one-on-one. -on -one. Charles Barkley tells John Kennedy about his next move. Sorry, I'm a basketball player. Of course, I'm gonna love those little innuendos. Before we jump into the interview with Charles Barkley, I wanted to read John Kennedy's editor's letter from this issue. So here we go. I remember reading a cartoon some years ago that made reference to Bill Bradley's first Senate campaign. The strip imagined the press conference for Bradley's announcement in which an unseen voice asks, Bill, can you tell us how bouncing a leather ball for eight years qualifies you for the US Senate? But now that Bradley has been a distinguished senator from New Jersey for 17 years, retiring next year, his unlikely path to Washington via the hardwood floors of the NBA is little more than a quaint footnote. Charles Barkley wants to run for governor, and he wants to do it without forfeiting his flair for the incendiary statement. There are a few other things worth noting. He is a Republican. He is married to a white woman, and he wants to run in the state of Alabama. As long as Sir Charles is bouncing a leather ball, we forgive him for all the money he makes and the controversy he creates. As long as he is in that all too familiar role of the black entertainer slash athlete, we can discount what he says. But I wonder if we'll be quite as accommodating when he changes those familiar reference points and tells us how to spend our tax dollars and teach our children. Whatever happens, it will be a race worth watching. This February 22nd, George Washington would have turned a spry 264 years old. If it's true, as Thomas Jefferson wrote, that George's mind was slow in operation, being little aided by innovation or imagination, but sure in conclusion, these might have been some of his hard thought conclusions as he perused his complimentary third issue. By now, he would probably have reconciled himself to sharing his birthday with Lincoln on the third Monday of each February, after heavy lobbying from the resort industry persuaded Richard Nixon to sign the president's holiday law in 1971. And he no doubt would have been stunned at some of the other articles we offer in our continuing effort to find politics in strange places. These days, the most terrifying thing for an aspiring American statesman isn't a phalanx of oncoming redcoats, but rather a phone call from a diminutive 25-year-old journalist named Ruth Shallot. The king of the political realm isn't a madman named George, but an avuncular, suspender-clad mouth named Larry. And the president of America's team isn't a learned patrician steeped in the art of compromise, but a former wildcatter with a taste for litigation. But we'd keep George happy yet with the gift that keeps on giving, a recipe for his favorite pie, cherry, from our favorite Martha, Stewart. Here's to many more birthdays like this one. And I literally laughed out loud at the picture on this page. It's a picture of John Kennedy and Charles Barkley, and it says, that's Barkley on the left. Hilarious. I'm really glad he clarified that because I was kind of wondering which one was which. And now let's read about Sir Charles Barkley, an interview by John Kennedy. It's called Breaking Right. John Kennedy talks to Charles Barkley about the power game and why Sir Charles might just want to be Governor Charles. At 15, Charles Barkley was just another chubby teenager, more interested in sports and in running with the wrong crowd than in schoolwork. But over the next year, he grew five inches, focused his energies on basketball, and showed glimpses of a formidable talent. Then he got lucky. During an ordinary late season game at his high school in Leeds, Alabama, his hometown, scouts from Auburn University came to check out Travis Abernathy, a teammate of Barkley's with a reputation as a hot prospect. But it was Barkley, not Abernathy, who dominated the game. On that night, a man, now known as Sir Charles, began a journey that would take him from a hustling young kid in Leeds to Auburn standout to NBA superstar. Now he is on the verge of a surprising career change. In recent months, Barkley has begun to speak of returning to Alabama and running for governor. Though neither the tallest nor the most gifted player in the NBA, Barkley excels because of his sheer determination. Particularly when a game is on the line, there is no one who wants to win more or works harder than Barkley does. But such talent has its consequences. The beast within that drives Barkley to win has also pitched him into controversy. 
Whether calling himself a 90s N-word or proclaiming on TV that he is not a role model, Barkley's insistence on just being himself may cost him endorsement money and fan support. But during his traveling road show of life, he has moved beyond sports and has been transformed into a provocative cultural presence. One gets the sense talking to Barkley that he is amused that we are so amused. He radiates freedom. He can say whatever he wants, do whatever he wants, and he knows that like eager children, we will always come back for more. Like Muhammad Ali a generation earlier, he unselfconsciously uses the pulpit of sports to celebrate himself and at the same time raise provocative questions about race and the role of sports in society. Suddenly, the prospect of a Barkley candidacy doesn't seem so far-fetched. Whatever else you might think of Charles Barkley, he has name recognition, money, confidence, humor, a larger-than-life persona, and the audacity of a winner. People have won elections with far less. John Kennedy starts the interview with this question. Rumor has it, you're thinking of running for governor of Alabama. Charles replies, it's funny. When I first started talking about it, I didn't know if I was really 100% serious, but I spend a lot of time in Alabama and see how far behind the times it really is. So I started thinking about what I could do and it just snowballed. Now I try to fend off the subject. I say, hey, relax until I'm through playing basketball because right now basketball is my number one priority. John asks, what first gave you the idea of running for office? And Charles replies, I've funded academic scholarships at my high school, my college, and my church. I was talking to some friends and I said, you know, we've got to do something to really improve the public school system. I mean, I can only send X amount of kids a year to college. And one of my friends said, why don't you run for public office? We batted it back and forth. And then I said it publicly one time and it just took off from there. John said, do you think people like the idea? Charles says, hey, when I'm in Alabama, I must have at least 100 people a day come up and tell me they would love me to run. John said, why do you think they're so intrigued? And Charles says, there hasn't been a prominent black Southern governor in this country except for maybe Douglas Wilder, and I don't consider Virginia the South. I think people in the South want to go to the next level. It's just that nobody has come along to take them there. John says, where do you want to take them? And Charles says, my message is, hey, you've got to get an education. You've got to develop your confidence and self-esteem. There are a lot of Charles Barkleys out there, maybe not in basketball, but in some other profession or vocation, but they don't even know it because they've got such low self-esteem. When I talk to kids, their attitude is, hey, there's not really a chance I'm going to be anything. I can't afford to go to school. I can't get a job, so I might as well steal and kill. I've got nothing to lose. John said, you're a pretty outspoken fellow, which may or may not be the best quality for a politician. How do you think your outspokenness goes over in the world of sports? Charles says, some people think I'm the biggest asshole in the world because I always want to talk about a serious issue. I mean, I don't care about basketball. Sure, I want to win, but I also want to talk about racism and what we can do to help the underclass. But the people in basketball just want you to sell products and play well. John said, do you ever feel pressure to rein it in? Charles says, no, because if somebody comes up to me and says, Charles, we don't want you talking about this stuff, I'm going to say to them, so I suppose then that you think racism is all right? John says, does being outspoken cost you money in endorsement deals? Charles replies, it's probably cost me $20 million, but you can't put a price tag on this. When you get to a point where money is more important than the stuff you believe in, then you're lost. And there's no way I will let that happen. I owe it to my family. I owe it to all black people. John said, actually, I think part of the press likes your outspokenness. You always give them quotes they can use. Do you wish more players were as outspoken as you? Charles says, but they're not going to speak out. Players are scared of being blackballed as a result of what they say. Hey, if I was a mediocre player, I would have been long gone by now. John said, why do you really want to run for governor? Charles says, because there's one thing I've learned in life that is very disappointing to me. The haves do not care about the have nots. It's sad. John said, you're definitely a have. Charles replies with, right. And if we don't help the have-nots, they've got no chance. That's why I'm trying to bring as many people with me as possible, because otherwise they have no chance. I just wish poor people could be rich for one day and see how different it is from being poor. I've been both. It would be like, hey, I can do this. But no, they can't. The system is structured, so they never get the chance. John says, is your message of hard work and self-reliance fundamentally a conservative one? Charles says, no question. But you know, conservative, liberal, moderate, those are all just words to me. I'm pro-choice, for example. I'd prefer that people didn't have abortions, but it's not up to me. John said, but you said that you're a Republican. Charles says, I don't like everything about the Republican Party, but there are things about the Democratic Party that drive me crazy. John says, like what? Charles replies, okay, 
I'm a big believer that you have to control your own destiny, and some of the Democrats' social programs are designed to keep you poor your whole life. John said, come on, do you really think the Democrats design social programs to keep people poor? Charles says, the Democrats will give you fish, but they won't teach you how to fish. The Republicans say, hey, if you don't learn how to fish on your own, you're not going to eat. I'd rather the man look at me and tell me, hey, F you. If you don't do it on your own, you're not going to do it. I'd choose any party that wants to put an end to some of these social programs. Just gut them. John says, give me an example. Charles replies with, welfare should be temporary and recipients shouldn't be rewarded for having more kids. People should be made to work while they're on welfare or go to school or get job training. John said, would you be a Republican if you weren't a millionaire? Charles replies, Republicans don't penalize you for being successful, but you do change and there's nothing wrong with changing. I have a lot of friends who work for me and at the rate I get taxed, I feel like I'm always out of money, but I'd lay them off before I became poor again. John said, what does your family think about your being a Republican? Charles says, we fought about it. And I said, if I hadn't made it in the NBA, could you tell me our life would be better or the same or worse for being Democrats? Alabama is one of the poorest states in the union and has always been Democratic. John said, could you handle the pay cut as governor? Charles laughs. You know, it wouldn't even matter. I just think I owe people something. God gave me a gift. And if all I do is play basketball and make a fortune, I don't think that's fair to God. John said, you grew up in a small town, Leeds, Alabama, in a poor family. If you hadn't played sports, what would your options have been? Charles said, when you're from a small town or you're poor, you really don't have a lot of options. You can't afford to go to school, but you can't get a job either. People who have the great willpower and self-esteem to push, push, push can overcome that. So I either made it in sports or I didn't make it. I grew from 5'11 to 6'4 my junior and senior year, and then my only goal was to go to college for free and get a good job, and I thought that if I kept getting better, I could get a scholarship. John said, did you go to college in Alabama to be near your family? Charles replies with, yeah, my mother and grandmother were far and away the most important people to me. My father was not there. John asks, did your family tell you that college and sports were your ticket out? Charles replies, see, in Alabama when I was growing up, all the kids ever talked about was making it in sports. They still don't realize that it's a lot easier to be a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer than it is to be an NBA player. John said, that sounds an awful lot like your ad in which you say, I'm not a role model, your parents are your role models. Charles says, right. After that ad, I started to debate this issue on talk shows. I said, listen, athletes are secondary role models. We've got to get the parents more involved in their kids' lives. We've got to let the kids know that being successful is not only about achieving success in basketball or sports. John asks, you've spent most of your life in a racially charged environment. Has that affected your attitude towards whites? Charles says, no, I'm very proud that I'm not racist. I could be the biggest racist in the world growing up in the South. John says, how did you avoid that? Charles says, remember, I grew up in Alabama during the Civil Rights Movement. Dr. King was down there. There was the bombing in the Birmingham church. As I got older, my mother, who was a maid and worked for white people, said, hey, listen, racism is wrong. And if you're ever racist, we'll kill you. John said, what about your family now? Your wife is white. How does that play? Charles replies with, she gets crap from black women all the time. And you know what I do? I tell her, it's always going to be like that. You just got to be effing tougher. Just say thank you and walk away. You know they ain't gonna say that to me. It was particularly weird during the whole OJ trial because people were saying that my wife looks like Nicole. She's about 5'10", blonde, a beautiful girl. And you get all that business that blacks and whites shouldn't be together. John says, what do you think of the verdict? Charles says, my personal opinion, I thought OJ was guilty. John says, really? Charles says, yeah, but I think everybody should just leave OJ alone, whether we agree or disagree with the verdict. The man's been found not guilty, so if I see him, I'm just, hey, take care of yourself. John says, it's interesting. There's something about you as a black athlete running as a Republican for the governorship of a southern state that's frankly more outrageous than, say, a Larry Bird running for office. Charles says, you said it yourself. It's because I'm black. Being Charles Barkley gets me a bigger audience and I can attract more attention, but at the same time, a lot more people will want to come after me. They'll kill me at the beginning. John says, what do you mean? Charles says, look, right now I can integrate into white society and I can integrate into corporate America pretty well too. But as a famous black man, I'm held to a much higher set of standards. You screw up and suddenly you realize just how black you are. You may be able to integrate, but when push comes to shove, they'll always remind you how black you are. John says, do you truly feel that African-Americans could feel at home in the Republican Party? Charles replies with, 
Black people always say, we're Democrats and that's it. They think Republicans only look out for rich people and the bottom line is 90% of black people are poor. So if I'm not smart enough to think for myself, I'm going to vote for the people I've always been told to vote for. Look, in a lot of ways, I really do want to be a Democrat, but they've got to show me that they're trying to raise people up and not just let them simply survive because you can't just survive in America. John Kennedy asks, is there racism in basketball? Charles replies with, I don't think so. One of the reasons I've always enjoyed sports is because it brings races together. I have white people cheering for me who might not like black people, but they'll cheer for me just the same. John says, is the lure of success in pro sports a mixed blessing for African Americans? Charles says, well, sports are somewhat detrimental to blacks because even though some blacks are generating billions of dollars, that money is not really helping the black communities. I would love to see some of those billions put back into inner city or into poor black neighborhoods, but it won't get there because that's just the way it is. I read that Michael Jordan is making $40 million a year, and if they're paying him $40 million, they've got to be making an astronomical amount on him, and that money is not getting to blacks. John asks, does the NBA do enough in the way of funding inner city programs? And Charles replies, they do token stuff like the stay in the school program. If I had any say in it, I'd make the NBA do more. They run a $5 billion business. And even though the players make a lot of money and the league makes a lot of money, they're all greedy. They make the money and want to keep it to themselves. John says, what do you suggest they do? Charles replies with, I think they should make every team donate $1 million in real scholarship money. These kids in the cities are buying our products. We should help them. Because let me tell you something, if we keep letting the have not suffer, they're going to eat us up. John said, I was in your state of Alabama a few months ago and learned about the chain gangs doing cleanup work on the state's highways. What do you think of them? Charles says, I think they're great. John said, why? Charles says, because I think that every prisoner should be made to work eight hours a day to clean up the street to earn their keep. Certain people can be rehabilitated and those people should be taught crafts and job skills. John said, and the violent criminals who can't be rehabilitated? Charles says, they should be made to work. You know, it costs more to keep someone in prison than to send them to college. And as a taxpayer, I don't want to spend that much. John said, we keep hearing talk of your retirement, so here's your chance. When are you going to retire? Charles says, I'm 32. My ideal scenario would be to play this year and then take a couple of years off and relax. John says, any reason for the break? Charles says, I'm tired and beat up, and I want to relax for a little bit. I don't want to jump right into the fire. My back is killing me. My knee is killing me. Sounds like a true basketball player. John said, and what about the political plans, the governorship? Charles says, hey, I'm only 32. I could care less about working. I've never had a job, and I don't really ever want to have one. It's not going anywhere. The same problems will be there, but a lot of people think I can win. John said, last question. Do people ever accuse you of being co-opted because you're rich and hang out with white people? After all, entertaining a majority white audience in the arenas like you do, doing endorsements for big corporations? Charles interrupts, I have been very consistent talking about racism. I always tell people, if you really, really want to experience racism, number one, grow up in Alabama, number two, marry a white woman, and three, be an outspoken black man. And that means no matter how much money I will make or how well I play basketball, I'll always be black. Number one, I love this article because it's about basketball. Number two, I love this article because Charles Barkley brings up some great points about being black and being a Republican. I think there's this sense of it being an oxymoron these days, but the more time goes by, it seems like there are more minorities waking up to the fact that perhaps the Democratic Party is not what they thought it was. And speaking from experience as a former Democrat, I can see why they would go from Democrat to Republican. I just think Charles Barkley was ahead of his time when it comes to race and political parties. I think he had it right back in the 90s. I'd love to know your thoughts of this article. Put it in the comments if you have time. I really appreciate you watching. Have a great week and I will see you next time. George, which is a hoot of a magazine. I thought you were a lawyer. I was. What happened? Well, we uh, we decided. I mean, 
actually taking a cue from from folks like yourself and you around the 1992 election that that there was an opportunity here to uh, change the definition of a political magazine. Uh, certainly, the way Americans were uh, accessing information about politics and politicians was changing. Uh, candidates were appearing on late night talk shows, on talk radio, on sitcoms, uh, and there was a, a kind of a leveling process. And while the rest of media clearly had caught up with that, we felt that political magazines, per se, hadn't. Your mother was a hell of an editor at Doubleday. That's what I hear. Would she have liked George? I think she would have.